Our subject today for the College Video Archives is Christian Fiss, always known as Chris Fiss, who was art master here from 1974 to 1997, and who continues, thankfully, to present us with his magnificent artistic impressions, often in caricature form of members of the staff. So he is still a very living part of the college. Now, Chris, what were the circumstances of your coming to the college? You had been in advertising, I remember. Could you tell us a bit about your move from the world of advertising to the world of teaching? See, I came here in, in, to Ireland in 1960, and I started in advertising. In those days, the advertising world had a certain glamour to it. I mean, as a young designer, I'd been working in the um, drawing room of the University of Leiden in the geological and um, archaeological department. And although it was a very secure job in those days, because you were more or less a civil servant and there was a pension attached, and my mother was very proud of it, but there was no ad adventure in the whole setup. And uh, so, therefore, I answered an, an, an ad for artists, commercial artists, in uh, Ireland. And as I had never heard about Ireland, I thought this might be quite exciting. But when I entered advertising, I didn't, when the years went by, I didn't quite like it. It was a world that I didn't like at all. There was a lot of, of competition amongst artists. Um, there was a lot of what I perceived as dishonesty in um, advertising certain products. Um, I, I just didn't like it. And I remember the last advertising agency I was in. You see, there's another aspect to advertising as well, the advertising world, that you actually have to change from advertising agency to other advertising agency in order to go up in that particular world. If you don't do that, you just become a nunity and you get pushed away in the shadows. So, <clears throat> eventually the last agency I was in, and what really uh, made me decide that this was definitely not the world to be in, was that we had to do the advertising for Quintsworth. And that was the last days of Quintsworth and the leader of the Quintsworth Empire and who embarked on all sorts of things and who I then already saw, foresaw, like a number of my colleagues in the same studio, that the whole thing was going wrong. I didn't like it. It was, it was not the sort of thing that I wanted to do. I also felt that I couldn't develop as an artist. When you are a commercial artist, you simply draw to please the public in general, because you have to sell to that, and that's not too bad, but you usually have to please the customer who gets you to advertise for him. And usually there's an in-between person of the advertising agency and the customer, the, the client, you know, the firm, whatever. And you simply are told by all those different sides what to do and how to do it. And when you bring anything in any idea of yourself sometimes get totally destroyed and totally neglected and said that it is no good and you know you know yourself that it is good and that what they want you to do is not such a good idea. What were your first impressions of the college? It must have been very strange coming from a rather wild artistic world to coming to the ordered, traditional, rather gloomy cloistered halls of this college, so reeking of tradition. I quite liked that. I liked the tradition, but it was, it was of course, more or less a culture shock. You know, um, going into chapel and the going in wasn't too bad, but the coming out was a bit um, intimidating, where the boys were silently standing on both sides in cloisters, and we had to walk in between that. And... Uh, I felt very much like, uh, are they going to kick me or whatever, you know, being the new master. And all sorts of stories were being told about what happened to new masters. Which of course, they, they, just, they were just taking me for a ride, of course. Um, I also experienced the, 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 the last um, 
vestiges of the tradition of the dining hall, which uh, shortly afterwards gives changed. You see, the juniors had their meals downstairs. It was a junior dining hall then. And then you had the, the proper dining hall. And um, I was only there part time, you see. So I wasn't there every day. I just got certain hours. But sometimes it necessitated me to be there for lunchtime. And I was just told to go into the dining hall. And then I was told. I was never told beforehand. This was one of the strange things that I found here in Columbus College, that it was more or less assumed that you knew how Columbus College worked. And they took it for granted that you knew. Of course, I didn't know that at all. And especially coming from a country where boarding schools are rare. The only boarding schools that we have there are for uh, people who have children, you know, people, the, the, the parents of the children are involved in shipping, for instance. Uh, Shipping on, on the Rhine, you know, those, those big, big vessels that cruise on the Rhine, you know, so they, they, they have to have their children in a boarding school. But that's, that's, you know, that's not the same thing at all. There isn't that sort of tradition, you know. So I came, I was ushered into the dining hall. I, th I then was told that I had to sit at the head of the table. <clears throat> I knew only a very few boys who were actually sitting at that table. I was only teaching the forms up to fourth form. I didn't teach fifth form and sixth form at all. And um, so the whole thing was quite intimidating. And then, of course, uh, <clears throat> all of a sudden we were told more or less to get up, or they did stand up, because the warden and his wife and several senior teachers came in and took their place on days. And then a prayer in Latin, a short prayer was said. And then we were allowed to sit down. And then the meal just started and a couple of boys were delegated from each table to collect the food which was put on the table then and you took it from uh, <clears throat> the various receptacles but I remember that I didn't know what was going on and as I said I didn't know the boys at all I didn't I, I didn't know their names I hardly knew the names of the boys I was teaching up there so short and then there was this large figure looming behind me and a rather intimidating voice said, Sir, your boys are misbehaving. <laughs> and apparently this was the woman who was in charge of the kitchen, who I had never met. I didn't know her at all. And uh, so they were. I mean, what was I supposed to do? <laughs> you know? But I mean, all went well anyway. And after a short while, uh, Mr. Uh, Warden Gibbs changed this completely. Would you like to talk a bit about the physical appearance of the college in those days. Mm, yes, yes, that was actually quite interesting. Um, when I first came here, I taught in the drive studies, a part of it. One part was the art rooms, which were very small. And next door was the pottery room. And a chap called, what's his name? I can't remember his name now. A very small chap who taught pottery there. <clears throat> and um, it was very, very small. I think the, the most left-hand side of it was still studies for certain senior pupils. And then, of course, this was changed. And I was moved over to the, um, what used to be, what, what is now still the pottery room downstairs and upstairs was made into an art room. Uh, it took a while before they put in a proper floor. What we still had, we had the troughs there that we used to fall over, you know, the concrete troughs alongside the wall for, because it used to, they used to keep their prize pigs in there. I believe Columbus College used to win. It was years before I came there anyway. That stopped quite uh, quite a while before I actually came to that. They used to breed pigs and they won prizes with it. They were very proud of it, apparently. And then I moved in. And I think the atmosphere wasn't much different. <laughs> well, and then of course you, you got the, the, the physical change. You asked about physical change uh, of the various buildings. And uh, Gibbs, of course, realized that there was 
an acute shortage of, of teaching space. And uh, especially that more girls used to come to the college then. And when I first came, there were, there were only a few girls there. I mean, not an awful lot. And they were only in fifth and sixth form. Uh, but that started to increase, and also the number started to increase. So the first building, I think, was um, Subo, was it? The one down there beside the um, beside the, the music room there. That was designed by the warden, and he asked me to do my artistic bit on it, on the design. And John McDonald was involved, of course who was a very sound builder, but his ideas didn't always coincide with our ideas, <laughs> and we had to be very careful how to handle him. I remember Gibbs saying, the way you do it is, you talk around him, so that in the end he's convinced that it was actually his idea. <laughs> that actually worked quite well. You know? So, and then you got Todd. That was a major enterprise. And um, again, we had a bit of a <laughs> <laughs> problem with John McDonald who wanted to, he had put in beautiful windows made of hard wood and he wanted to oil the windows and of course that was totally as far as we were concerned Warden Gibbs and myself it was totally against the idea of George and houses you just painted the window and eventually we convinced him that it was better to paint it and he did paint them so those were major changes. There was also another building which I didn't like. I'm still not quite sure what I do like it. I can't remember what the names are. But um, geography was taught in that by uh, the chaplain, Michael Heaney. It's quite close to the art complex. I can't, can't remember the names. There were just two, two rooms. And uh, the only thing that we could do is to put in windows with small panes. And that is the only thing that relates the design to the college. I wasn't asked to come into the design at all. I doubt even if, if Warden Gibbs had a hand in the design of that. I think at a certain point we both agreed that it looked more like a, a railway carriage set, you know. <laughs> but there you are. But thought was a different matter. Uh, it was a design that was very, very functional. I'm not quite sure whether it's a beautiful building, but it was very functional. We did our best to make it fit in with the environment. You know? Of course, the top building was used for art exhibitions too. That's right. It was very close to your sphere. That's right, yes, yes, yes. And we had some very important art exhibitions in there. Um, see, Gibbs, one Gibbs found art very, very important. And he did his best to make it as important as possible. Uh, so we um, thought of those ideas of, of exhibitions. And we had three exhibitions a year. Uh, the one in the first part of, of the year, in the first term, was where art was judged and by an outsider. And again, Warden Gibbs did his best to make it into a very big occasion. I remember well that uh, I usually had to try and find some prominent person in the artistic world. And then what happened was that um, this person used to come up in the afternoon and had a look at all the art which was displayed on stage as much as we could put up and it was usually at least one picture per person who did art. This was my stipulation, that I wanted every child who did art to have a piece on the exhibition. Uh, because I find that very important. I find it very important. I think it's a mistake just to show the best pieces of art, because that's not what art in schools is, is about. You know, it's, it has a function. It's not to try and produce the best artists that we can. If, if, if we get very good artists, that's a bonus. But that's not, of course, the part art plays in the school. So, and then this, this chap used to look early in the afternoon, usually on a Saturday, it, was, it happened. 
at it, and then we withdrew into the warden's dining room. And there, Warden Gibbs and his charming wife, Sally, had prepared a beautiful meal. And uh, there were candles, and there was a marvelous atmosphere, and it was the best of food and wine, and which impressed the visitor very much. And the visitor felt really that he was, or she, was a very important person. And then at almost near the end, when all the troops were already let in to the big school, and were eagerly awaiting you know, the arrival of the judge, um, the, the, the head prefect used to come in and say, sir, they're in the big school room and they're waiting and they're ready. And one Gibbs used to say, not at all, sit down, boy, and, you know, have a bit of, you know, gave him a glass of wine and, you know, gave him some um, dessert. And this, I thought this was beautiful. It was so much part of the Columbus ethos, if, you know, for, I thought it was very important. And, and the, 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 the visitor found it fantastic, of course, and then we went over there. Uh, Warren Gibbs and Mrs. Gibbs, the visitor, and my humble self. And uh, the worst part was that I had to introduce the visitor. And I had to get up on the stage, and this is one of the things that I never liked. I found it quite, you know. You have captured so many of the foibles of members of staff, and indeed pupils, over the years. You obviously have profound insights into human nature. Are there any Columbus personalities over the years you would like to mention? Every single one is a character, really, you know. And uh, what, what, what I found quite amazing coming from a world where you have really have to, have to be careful when you got to know certain people, especially if you only knew them from having dealings with them in advertising, for instance. You never knew what sort of person they were. You never knew whether you could trust them. You know, there was always a, a kind of a discord in firms like that. And uh, I had heard that that existed in schools as well, um, especially in third level places like the NCAD, the National Court of Art, which hasn't got a very good reputation when it comes to that. But I found it remarkable how, how helpful the staff was and how they assumed immediately that you were a part of them. And they treated you as such. Of course, uh, as regards characters, yes. I mean, there's so many of them I can think of. Mr. Kennedy was such a kind person. Um, Christopher Fettis, who was a, a, an immense help to me when I first started. And you never really realized that he had helped you until much later. That, you re that was Christopher Vettis. He did advise me to do that. And it actually worked. He used, to, he used to be so supportive. And so were quite a number of, of uh, members of staff. I never forget Ninian, who... Uh, see, in the beginning, I, I, I dressed still in the way I used to dress in, in, in advertising. And Ninian once looked at me when we were sitting together, and he was at then residing in what was called the doll's house, which is the, the little cottage at the end of Second Garden, is it? Yeah. And he looked at me and he said, don't worry, Vis, we'll get you down to our level. <laughs> what he meant was, you know, tie and proper dress, really, you know. Warden Gibbs looms large in your life, indeed, as he did in everybody else's. Have you anything specific you would like to say about this very, I think, artistically sensitive man? He was a very strict person, but you knew where you were with him. His values were, happened to be also my values. Extraordinarily so, because we came from two completely different backgrounds and different experiences. Uh, I got on very, very well with him, but he, that didn't mean that he... That he I think he, he respected what, 
of the things that I did. But he, he never hesitated in correcting me if things went wrong, you know, what he perceived to be wrong. And of course, there, were certain, there are certain aspects in my way of working that doesn't please everybody. I'm inclined to be a bit messy at times, you know, in the art room, and it used to upset him at times, and he felt that he had to say something, and he never hesitated that. But I mean, you take that insight because you know that he's right. He was right, and I had to see to it as it was. But we got on very, very well. His ideas, his principles were very sound. And um, quite often when I came into the common room and I left it again uh, simply to go back to the art room, not for teaching that I had a free period, he used to call me into his office and we just talked. We talked about all sorts of things. Apart from art, were there any specific areas related to art in college with which you were involved? Well, there, there was, you see, I wasn't, I wasn't involved in sport, thank God, because I'm not a very good sports person anyway. And what can you expect from a Dutchman anyway? You know? <laughs> I still don't understand rugby, I still don't understand cricket, you know. The only thing what I was told about cricket is that it was so marvellous that you could actually go away for about an hour, have your tea and come back and nothing had changed, you know. <laughs> but for me, of course, nothing did change in cricket, you know. But, um, no, I was involved, of course, in, in stage building, stage design, uh, design for the props of the stage. And that was, was quite interesting. Um, well, other things, you see, a spin-off of, of teaching in the college was that I also did, in, on a number of occasions, I did summer school in Cork, where I was assisted by um, fifth and sixth formers, sometimes even fourth formers, who were my assistants in teaching. And that was a, a very good experience, um, both for me and I think also for the boys and girls involved. We had a great time, and it really showed their character, and they're, they're very, very sound, very sound indeed. What else was I involved in? Well, taking duty, but that wasn't a very uh, pleasurable <laughs> aspect, you know. Uh, well, I mean, one just did his duty, and uh, that's it. Would you like to mention a bit about your early artistic influences, and indeed some of your favorite painters and their characteristics? That's, that would be rather difficult to answer. Um, my main influences was an, an, a teacher in the primary school in Holland. I was brought up in a very small village south of Leiden. And um, we, the, the village was mainly Roman Catholic, 90% of it. 10% um, or probably even less was Protestant. So there was a very small Protestant community and a very small, consequently, a very small school, which was a state school, but it was only, of course, visited by Protestant children and uh, non-religious, uh, children from non-religious backgrounds, which, of course, there weren't many of them, but there were, who were, of course, uh, regarded with great suspicion. <laughs> but we had a teacher who was a terrific man, he was a very good artist, he also, he was a man of many talents, he was very musically inclined and all that. But he had to teach all six classes in one big room. And it just shows that it does not depend on, on very good facilities, but it depends on the personality who is teaching. Of course, facilities help, help a great deal, but they're not the main thing main thing is personality. And he took an interest immediately in uh, my brothers, my two brothers and myself. But it was really myself and my twin brother who were very good at art. And he took an, an interest. And that was really the starting point. And really uh, gave us the love for art and the, you know, the execution of, of art. Um, as regards to artists, it's, it's very hard to say because there's so many that I admire. Um, 
I usually, when I, when I prefer certain artists, it's because of, 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 of their character and their work. Uh, I thought Rembrandt was one of my heroes because he had such an incredible insight in the human character. If you look at any of his portraits, he's not just trying to portray the person, but he's trying to portray the insight, what he thinks is, makes this person think, take that, what, what's inside that person. And he always succeeds. His, his biblical paintings are, are full of, of, of atmosphere and full of understanding. He obviously um, experienced biblical stories himself, really. He thought about it and he put himself in the position of those people. And that's what I admired in him. Another person who is an exception to the rule, most artists were quite well off. Rembrandt was actually in the end quite well off. Uh, he just didn't ha know how to handle his money. And that's why he died. In the, Comparatively poor state, but the exception was Vincent van Gogh, who was always poor. I have my theory about that, uh, but um, he only during his lifetime he only sold two paintings, and yet he had an incredible struggle before he became a painter. He was a very human person, and uh, he had a great compassion for his fellow human beings. Uh, he taught in, in a school, a small school in England, and then he worked as a lay preacher in the coal mines in Belgium, and um, preferred to suffer with the people rather than... He was almost like a Christ-like figure. He used to give his clothes away, he used to give his money away. And then he became an incredibly uh, good painter in the end, at a rather late stage in his life. But. Um, he was trying to get his painting sold through the help of his brother, Theo. I, but Theo is, is admired in this history because of the letters. There was there's a terrific volume of correspondence between the two brothers. But um, I think Theo could have been able, would have been able, if he had believed in his brother's work, to sell a hell of a lot more. Because a lot of work was not similar, but it had the same sort of idea, which was the, almost the post-impressionistic thing. Other artists, because there's so many of them, I like the work, not the person, but the work of Picasso, which spans such an enormous uh, part of the changes in art in the 20th century. And, um, of course, there's some of the moderns, uh, Piet Mondrian, who is very, very abstract, Again, I liked him because of the way he worked. You, know. you graduated from the pig shed to the cow shed as teacher of art here, and now in your retirement, you come back and see the magnificently newly uh, constituted old gym, which now is the new art centre. What is your feeling about the change of the importance of art? in the college over the years? Well, I think the Statue of Art has always been regarded as very important. Uh, Warren Gibbs always did his utmost, but then he was bound to, to, to various other aspects of the college, of course, and other subjects. You see, if a subject is not regarded by the Department of, of, of Education as being very important, there's very little you can do as a school because you have to... The other subjects, of course, are much more important, but he, he definitely, as I remember so well in one of his introductory speeches, when, you know, at, at an exhibition or something like that, he used to say to the pupils, now look around you. Every single thing that you look at had to be designed. You know, he said that was all, uh, you know, you had to be able to, to imagine things, you know. So, it was always a very important aspect. Art was always a very important aspect. It, the problem was to try to instill that into the pupils and into the parents of the pupils. Not all of the parents understood the importance of art. Uh, most parents thought that art was a nice thing that they might have if they ever retired, so they could go back, you know. 
and some of them thought, well, maybe if little Johnny is good for nothing else, he might be able to get a career. In. And that's not what art is about, you know. And and I'm trying to, in trying to make clear to the parents that what art is about is to develop the imagination of the pupil, to develop the other part of the brain, to be able to think in an imaginative way. You can always solve problems, no matter what sort of subject, by using your imagination. Chris Fiss, thank you very much for submitting so patiently to my questions for the Columban Candid Camera over the last few hours, I'm sure it seems to you. Your retirement, of course, strikes me as being rather bogus, since you are obviously so artistically creative. And may I wish you many more years of fulfilled and happy creativity, and may your connection with the college continue to ripen and flourish. Thank you. Thank you.